very much, Tom. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. And uh, so, yeah, I'm going to just kind of give a kind of an overview of all the, the stuff going on with the Southern African Large Telescope. There's a few of us here from the observatory, and uh, Carol and Brian will be giving a talk tomorrow about some more work at the observatory. And um, But yeah, feel free to come up and ask us about what's going on at the observatory. It's a great place to work and uh, a lot of fun challenges to face. And so here are some of the, the, the challenges that we are facing. But we do uh, use Python a lot, especially with the, the salt and with the data coming from salt. And so I mean, we basically do use it as a scripting language, like a, a lot of other people do, to actually kind of glue things together, and particularly for running our pipeline. Our pipeline, then, it's very important for actually uh, allowing an interface for the astronomers, so building graphical interfaces with the astronomers to allow them to look at the data, analyze the data, but also for monitoring our performance of the telescope, and so building things uh, which actually produce and record the outputs and the results. But, and obviously very important for us, we're doing the data reduction. For getting rid of systematic errors in the data, for getting rid of, um, uh, for calibrating the data. This is really what we actually mainly use, uh, you know, this is really the heart of what we do. Um, especially for our uh, investigators who are all around the world, we do some basic processing. So that they're ready to do the science they want to do with the data. And then once they have the data, we're doing the data analysis. So once you have an observation, looking at what you're looking at, uh, you know, whether it's a star, a galaxy, a uh, gas cloud in the universe, how do you actually translate that into some type of real understanding of, about the universe? Um, you know, obviously it's very important to actually then take all these things for how we monitor the performance of the telescope, for how we reduce the data, for what the science is coming out, for reporting the results. And then a very key and a very important thing is also finally uh, teaching and using our results in the development of what we're doing to actually educate the next generation of astronomers. This is very important, especially in South Africa. And so the project that we're actually using this with, and, and Python is the glue that is binding this all together, um, but what we're using it for is for the Southern African Telescope. And this is located, SALT is located in Sutherland, which is about four and a half hours northeast of Cape Town. And uh, it's a very uh, vast and remote area, which is great because it makes a very dark sky. But here's the plateau where the telescopes are located at. And this is the Southern African um, Astronomical Observatory uh, site in Sutherland. The small telescopes <coughs> are in the background, but the, the main optical facility is the Southern African Large Telescope. It's a 10 meter uh, diameter telescope. And here it is in the front. If we take a closer look at SALT, uh, what you can actually see here, uh, the uh, primary mirror is 11 meters in diameter. It's the largest telescope in the southern hemisphere. It is 91 one meter segments uh, created in a spherical shape. It basically acts as a giant light bucket. The idea is to collect as many photons as you can get from an astronomical source. These photons are then actually focused uh, to the, the uh, primary mirror is actually set at a fixed angle, which is ideal for observing things like the Large Magellanic Cloud. This is a small galaxy with or orbits around our own galaxy, um, and uh, it was one of the most uh, nearest by galaxies. And the uh, um, orientation of SALT has been actually fixed to actually uh, optimize for obs observations of this object, but it is also able to observe a wide range of other objects uh, all across from near-Earth objects at, objects at the edge of the universe. But the primary mirror takes a light observed by an object and uh, light observed by object and focuses it at the tracker. And the tracker acts to follow stars across the night sky. And all of our instruments are located at the tracker. Um, and that's where actually, um, as I said, the light is focused and it does all the hard work. I don't know if we can dim the lights at all in here. But um, to kind of give you a perspective of what, what it's kind of like at a, a night at SALT, I have a short video here where this is, and hopefully you can see it, but this is actually from the perspective of the tracker. And unfortunately, maybe I'll turn this away as well. Whoops, let me restart that. Unfortunately, I'm not sure if the um, contrast on the, the projector is good enough to see it, but. And maybe for some closer, you can actually see it here, and I'll happy to show it to anyone else afterwards. But the tracker actually follows objects around the star, and the telescope moves around throughout the night making observations. 
And throughout the night, the telescope is Q-based. It could be making observations for a number of astronomers all around the world. It could be observing anything from near-Earth asteroids to, as I said, objects at the edge of the universe. Um, it moves to point to what's called the CCAS tower to help align the primary mirror so that it's actually producing the best image quality. And throughout the night, it will make a wide range of different observations, um, allowing us to do a wide range of different science projects. Here it's actually targeting a, a supernova in a nearby uh, galaxy. And here it uh, looks like actually, well, that last one was doing a, a comet. Obviously, this is a time lapse, so it's sped up a little bit. But this is basically what it looks like if you were on the primary mirror observing with salt throughout the night. So it's a nice little video put together by one of the astronomers who used to work at SAO, Bruno Letarte who is now working at Northwest University. Um, and, I'll just, and here at the end of the night uh, at the Southern Plateau, uh, obviously, uh, and, and here's the credits for Bruno. Um, but what do we actually do? How do we actually take the measurements? And there's two ways to actually do astronomical uh, observations in the optical. One of them is imaging. And so the main primary imaging instrument is SALDICAM. And it, what we can actually do is, you know, basically this is just taking a photo. Typically it's taken in, in small, narrow bands. And let me see if I can get this to restart. But if you can actually follow the little object which is moving along here, that's actually a near-Earth asteroid. This group of scientists from Poland are actually using SALT to observe near-Earth asteroids and measure how they're rotating. So they're actually looking for asteroids that will one day be actually good uh, uh, um, good asteroids actually land a science or a space mission on. Obviously, you want a slow rotating asteroid because it'll be a lot easier than a fast rotating one. The other main way, and this is really how salt <coughs> produces most of its science, is through spectroscopy. Now, everyone here has seen an example of spectroscopy. We've all probably seen a rainbow or a prism that breaks up light into its individual different components. And that's basically what uh, the spectrographs on salt do. They break up the light into the individual components so we can see from exactly what wavelength each, um, each photon of light is coming from. And in this case, we can take a look. This uh, top spectra here is a spectra of a star. And what we can actually do is from each of these wiggles, which are in the star, are actually due to different elements. So we can actually fingerprint the star and actually measure what the star is made of. Here we're looking at what the calcium and the iron content of that star uh, is. The other way to actually use spectroscopy is to actually measure motions. By looking at the shift of these spectral lines, we can actually measure how fast an object is moving. And here's an example of a salt spectra of hydrogen gas in the uh, spectra. And what's happening is that as the galaxy rotates, some of the gas, here's an example of the galaxy, here's an example of the spectra, as the galaxy rotates, as this part of the galaxy moves towards us and that part of the galaxy moves away from us, the spectra and certain spectral lines actually get shifted in different directions. Um, and we can actually then measure how fast that galaxy is rotating and hence derive basically how massive that galaxy is. And so to, in order to do, these, uh, to do, do spectroscopy, we have two main instruments on SALT, which is the Robert Stobie spectrograph, named after a former director of SAO. And I actually much prefer this image of the RSS spectrograph <laughs> because it slices and dices light in all the different ways possible. And it's a very powerful spectrograph and our very workhorse spectrograph and a great way to actually do and analyze data from objects in a wide uh, variety of ways. Our other main spectrograph is a high resolution spectrograph. And this spectrograph is very, very cool because it has uh, basically very high resolution and very high stability. So basically we can measure how fast a star is moving down to about one meter a second, which corresponds to about the speed you walk at. So we can actually measure stars around other uh, systems or, or other stars outside of the sun to actually look for small wobbles, which might be caused by planets which are orbiting around them. We can also use the HRS, for example, in this recent result, to actually study uh, objects which are actually exploding. This is a case of a star undergoing a, um, a, no a small nova explosion. And so basically uh, looking at basically thermo uh, thermonuclear explosion on the surface of a star which is kind of cool. We can actually use the high precision of HRS to actually measure how strong winds are coming off of the, uh, the star and the surface of the star. 
And so how do we use Python to actually get some of these wide range of different science results? And one way is actually on sky and in real time. And so we actually build a number of GUIs for the uh, or graphical user interfaces for the salt astronomer, the person who is at the telescope doing the observations, to be able to look at the data. And uh, these are actually based off of PyQt4. And these, what they allow them to do, take a quick look at the data, determine whether or not the data is useful or not useful, and also it will quickly distribute the data to the principal investigators if the data is of good quality. They can actually then go and quickly do their science. Um, some examples of very quick follow-up science done by SALT are supernova observations. In this case, um, Dan Mazlasevich, uh, who works at Dartmouth University, used SALT to actually study supernova. What he did was monitor, uh, basically would look for, uh, basically every day in the afternoon, Dan would email the telescope and say, there's this interesting supernova that just went off in this galaxy somewhere else. Uh, you know, you'd email him about 5 p.m., they'd uh, get the submission of his proposal by about, you know, maybe the object is up then and visible at 7 p.m., they get the telescope, they point it at the object, they get the spectra, they send it, process it, send it back to Dan, who would then actually analyze the spectra and then post his results and say, this is a really cool supernova, get more data. And so in this case, he actually monitored the supernova for over about 300 days to actually see how it was evolving and to see actually what is made up of the supernova, how the explosion evolves over time, and um, basically we can then actually better understand what type of objects these supernova are actually from and use them to actually help explore our universe. But it's only having these uh, really easy accessible tools to actually quickly distribute the data um, using basically mainly uh, basic standard Python packages for emailing, uh, uh, keeping track of the data, and distributing the data, and also for building um, interfaces for the astronomers to look at the data. As I said, the main heart for our, um, our uh, observatory for handling the data is our data pipeline. This is now what we actually use to actually reduce the data and to actually uh, take a look at the data. And the pipeline basically runs every day at 10.30 a.m. So after a full night of observations are taken, the pipeline runs and basically process through the data and then distributes the data to our wide range of investigators who are basically all around the world. We have uh, New Zealand, India, Europe, the US, um, and also a lot of the investigators in South Africa, of course. Um, basically, the, the pipeline goes through a number of different steps, including preparing the data, cleaning the images, removing all these systematic errors which are in the images, creating the documentation, measuring things about the data quality, recording the data and the information about the data in our MySQL database, uh, and then archiving the data, and then providing the data uh, online to actually, for uh, people to actually download, and then alerting um, the um, investigators to the actual uh, availability of their data. And other than basically cleaning the images, most of the other stuff is built by standard Python libraries plus inter interfaces with the MySQL database. And, um, as I said, one of the things this allows us to do is to monitor the performance of the telescope. This is an example of our monitoring the weather performance and a, a, a beautiful um, interface built by uh, Paul Kotze using basically matplotlib to actually uh, monitor base various weather uh, parameters about the telescope, to look at the wind, wind speed, uh, the seeing, the humidity, and actually see how the telescope is actually performing at any given time. We also use a wide range of different things to actually um, look at things such as measuring the performance, how often is the telescope observing, how much is it down for downtime, Mo monitoring the quality of the, the telescope. Do, um, are we losing throughput due to an increase of dust? Does the telescope need to be cleaned over time? We can actually monitor a wide range of different things and keep track of them. And we've actually, mostly we've been actually using static web pages um, and static graphs which are produced from these, but we are now starting to look at uh, migrating to Flask to actually produce more dynamic web pages and to, to actually provide a greater amount of information for our users. But as I said, the main heart of the, the pipeline is the data reduction, and everything is done via the PySalt package. And the PySalt package is basically based off of Python and Pyrath. Pyrath is built by um, basically the Space Telescope Institute, which runs the Hubble Space Telescope, but it basically is a Python wrapper for a legacy uh, astronomy code called IRAF. 
But the py PyRaf wrapper gives you basically all the, uh, basically gives you a more Python interface to the data. But including that, we've also built around NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, and also the AstroPy package, um, which is a, I'll mention a little bit later as well. And it basically is built on, uh, but basically gives you a number of different tools for actually analyzing the data, reducing the data, and analyzing the data. So we have, these are all now built at SAO uh, in-house and built on basically mainly, primarily Python uh, to provide tools for doing uh, basic CCD reductions with CCD as our imaging camera, um, tools to actually convert our spectroscopic data reductions into wavelength calibrated reductions, uh, tools for actually analyzing some of our different modes like our high resolution spectroscopy, and also tools for actually doing analysis of, um, we also have a very unique mode of high speed photometry on the uh, telescope, which I'll go into a little bit more detail. But some of these have actually led to further developments into uh, different packages, for example, the reduction of science gray data, which is the CCD proc data. Um, astronomers use charge couple devices, which is the same technology in your, your phone, but just the camera's worth about $500,000. <laughs> and so, uh, and they're cooled to about, uh, you know, minus 160 degrees. And so, you know, these are, we really want to clean up every last little speck in these data to actually make sure we're getting every last photon that we can observe. Because sometimes we're only getting a handful of photons um, to actually look at our objects. And so we have developed pure Python packages for actually uh, reducing and analyzing these data. Um, in addition, we've uh, developed an, uh, different tools, once again, built on PyQT4 to actually do wavelength calibration. And the nice thing is that uh, the astronomy community has been growing more and more to actually develop and adopt uh, Python. One of the, the things I set up for uh, reducing this is a package to actually model spectrographs. And now uh, others are actually going on to adopt this model to actually use at their observatories. And so there is actually a very large community of astronomers using Python and sharing a lot of code, uh, which is actually very helpful. Um, and you know, once you actually reduce the data, we can do actually certain different types of uh, analysis and data, uh, different types of science. And this is an example of using the Robert Sobey spectrograph to actually do some analysis on galaxies which are at very high redshift. And so this is actually combining, uh, this is Leo Tolelu at UNISA who is combining data um, basically using lower redshift galaxies which are actually causing higher redshift galaxies to be magnified. And so he's using galaxies which are relatively nearby to us. They're only about three or four billion light years away. Um, but he's using those to actually study galaxies which are 12 billion light years away. Um, and he's able to actually use the, the reduction pipeline to actually analyze a large number of data to find these galaxies which are actually really doing the lensing and to confirm their presence and to help build up the geometry to actually study these very, very high redshift galaxies. Likewise, the tools uh, for SALT also produce tools to analyze data. And so this is an example of once the data is actually reduced, we want to do the photometry and determine how much light is coming from a source. And this is, um, as I mentioned, the imaging camera actually has a high speed mode where it actually takes, uh, can be, take um, frames at basically a rate of about 10 hertz or about one frame every tenth of a second to actually study astronomical objects. And so even stars change, certain stars actually change on these time scales. One example of using this is by Steve Potter and Incarni Romero Comanero at uh, SAO. And here you can see an example of this. Um, if you watch the star over here, if it, you should actually be able to see it get fainter and then get brighter. And what you're actually watching is another star which is actually being eclipsed by another star which is orbiting around it. And what we're actually doing, hopefully maybe I can, should put that on repeat, but you can, actually watching another star which is being eclipsed uh, at, um, and what we're doing is actually measuring exactly when those eclipses happen. And what they did, they measured these eclipses and the data from SALT are actually at the top and highlighted in red there. To actually measure these eclipses where they happen, they noticed that they drifted. And the likely cause is that you have these two stars which are orbiting around each other, but then you also have planets which are orbiting around those stars and they're causing a drift in the orbit of the two planets. And so they actually were discovering a system which is like Tatooine, where you actually have two stars in the sky, which is uh, 
I don't know. I find that cool. It's the office. I know. Yeah. Kind of like the, the office impression of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I, I did have a Star Wars picture in here, but I think I took it out. So. Um, and so, as I mentioned, there's a large community of astronomers who are using Python. And uh, right now, one of the biggest um, activities right now is the AstroPy package, which is actually basically built off of you know, you have Python, and then you have the NumPy libraries, uh, the SciPy libraries, and the SciKit uh, libraries. And AstroPy is using and leveraging those libraries to actually develop tools for astronomers for uh, Python. Right now, there's over 80 uh, different astronomers who have been contributing to the package. Um, including at observatories at SAO, at the Hubble Space Telescope, at Gemini Observatory, and uh, at basically institutes all around the world who are actually contributing to this package to help make it better and to actually make things useful. Basically, so we're also not all redoing the same thing. So the packages are actually um, uh, basic packages for things doing like coordinate systems in astronomy. Some of them are then actually more advanced for doing um, different cosmologies, so we can actually you know, when we're actually checking our results and doing our science and looking at exactly how far away a star is, we can actually uh, have a built-in package. Some of them are for doing I.O. Most astronomy data comes in a format which is called FITS. Um, and so the package for reading and writing in that data uh, it has been converted to a, a Python package in AstroPy. The advantage of this is that we then have the base AstroPy package, which is then developing into a whole a core of different packages, and here on the right is the affiliate packages of AstroPy, and you can see, for example, CCD proc package, uh, but there's also packages for graphing uh, astronomical datas, um, like Apple Pi, uh, there's also machine learning packages, uh, AstroML, uh, and a wide range of different packages which are now growing out of this AstroPy activity, and coordinated effort between a large number of different astronomers to actually provide an open source and usable library for doing astronomy with with uh, Python. And so, um, and obviously to, to get to my last part here is, uh, it's very critical and important. I think if you attended Lars' talk, you also saw a lot of examples of using Python um, and um, for teaching with astronomy. And I also teach as part of the National Astrophysics and Space Science Program, uh, which is a, a program to actually give uh, students who are coming, especially from previous disadvantaged universities and from all over Africa, a chance, it's an honors level course and an introduction to astronomy. So they can actually get caught up on everything they need to do about astronomy and then go on to do their master's and their PhD. Typically, uh, we have about 20 students per year, but the base language for the course is Python. So all of their courses are taught in Python. Um, and um, in addition to teaching at the NAS course, we also have a number of uh, online uh, tutorials and also a number of workshops, which we also use to actually introduce Python to the community, to actually use it to expand uh, the number of things that we're doing and to, to, you know, it is actually a great resource. Um, I don't need to go into too much detail about this because Laura did a fantastic, uh, and uh, uh, Toby, who uh, gave previous talks on IPython notebooks, but it is an incredible resource. Uh, especially for teaching and for keeping track of what you're doing. And um, we've been setting this up for our CCD proc tutorial with uh, Matthew Craig at, in Minnesota. And then it's also a great tool for collaborating, for actually sharing data and what you're actually doing. Um, one thing I've actually recently done for my tutorial is I've actually had online questionnaires. Um, and I've been using actually uh, Sculpt, uh, which actually allows you, or a easy JavaScript um, interface for actually embedding uh, Python code into your websites. So um, it's a, a nice combination of actually allowing to actually put code in so a student can type it in and then they can actually have a button for checking their work. And so it's, uh, you know, then you can actually publish what the result is so they can actually either, you know, graph it up or uh, take a look at actually what they're doing. And so, um, and it was actually quite easy to actually integrate something uh, there's Sculpt, and then there's also Trinket, which is a wrapper on top of Sculpt for actually doing uh, this type of stuff. But uh, I think that actually uh, sums up what uh, I was hoping to tell you about today. Um, and that, you know, fortunately enough, due to Python's extensive library, ease of development, support, and diversity of applications for it, it's made it actually really incredibly useful for, um, to be able to quickly and produce productively do science and uh, makes it actually very easy to share it as well. And so um, 
there obviously is a, a lot of people here um, who actually I do want to thank. Um, I'll specifically say Gareth because he's actually in the audience, and uh, I'll make him wave. Gareth, and uh, who, um, uh, but the huge team at, at the Salt Os uh, Astronomy Operations, um, along with a number of other people, uh, and the huge Astro AstroPi collaboration, um, along with support from uh, South Africa and the National Research Foundation, uh, which has made a lot of my work possible. And so, um, and then I'll just end up with the references if anyone is actually interested in some links to some further information and looking at stuff. But uh, thank you very much for uh, your time. Well, thanks, Steve. Um, we've got 15 minutes, so hopefully there's a few questions. Could I ask one? Uh, you mentioned MySQL possibly switching to Flask. <clears throat> that's for uh, that's the back end to the web uh, distribution yeah. of information. Do you, what do you use for long-term storage? I mean, it's a lot of data. Is it MySQL as well, or is it a, another well, data store? The, for the information about the data, we use a MySQL database. And for the actual data itself, um, it's, it's a, I mean, we, it, we generate um, anywhere from 10 to 50 gigabytes a night. So it's, it's, it's put in a yeah, database. Yeah, so it's not, the data itself is not directly in a database. It's just in a Unix file storage. Uh, system. Can I ask you a question about that? I mean, you know, it sounds like you, uh, it sounds like you use Python for everything that you use it for because it's easy to write stuff in Python for just about everything. So all these, you know, stuff that you got to do every day, like store all the data, the 50 gigabytes you got, um, do, you, do you use Python like as a sysadmin, netadmin, and all that, just the whole nine yards? I'd like to move towards that. Uh, it's mostly bash and parsing. Okay. So, pretty short ones would be what it is. But for the, the front end web but, part yeah. that distributes the information, it's definitely a Python deal. Yeah. So, at least we're trying to move probably as much as we can to Python. Um, and, um, I mean, most of this, the front end stuff is currently moved over, but we're definitely moving over. We do have a number of different Chrome jobs that run every day, which are all Python based. And a number of other things, um, and so uh, use it as much throughout our system as we can. Hey, thanks a lot. Actually, that's related to a question I have. Um, so, what's 50 gigabytes a night a telescope produces? So, if you want to disseminate that data to people in the seas, uh, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I should I should preface it. Our our average is 10 gigabytes a night. Okay. And so, our our when we when we Certain, when certain instruments are running, then we can hit kind of the 50 gigabyte. And although in the next three to four years, we actually expect that to actually grow to up to 250 gigabytes a night. And um, you know, right now, um, we mainly, primarily just uh, um, compress all the data, uh, tar put it into a tarball, and zip the data, and then put it on a website. And then download it. And they download it. And basically, using WGET seems to actually work that's nowadays. Why, that's why my Netflix is so slow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which enough, we're on the, um, you know, the um, uh, research infrastructure, and then you know, so it gives us actually a pretty quick link to the um, the, the CTOM, CCAT. Yeah. C yeah. yeah. yeah right, so yeah. I work at SKA, and yeah. it's, of course, it's a huge problem for us because we're generating terabytes of data. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We can't, different we can't scale. SKA is a different scale problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you, you obviously don't just store all the data and then analyze it. Do you analyze it as it comes past? Yeah, so basically the one thing we have at the telescope is some and some tools actually analyze it in real time. So that uh, basically you won't be able to do the final analysis because you need a, a number of calibration frames and, and other things to actually fully do it. But um, a lot of it you can actually do in, get, you can get about 80% of the way in real time. And so that's why we do have that set up at the telescope. So there is an option for the observer or for the investigators where they can actually select they'd like their data in real time. And they're basically emailed a final or a, a preliminary spectra um, basically as it comes off the telescope. You know, it's, it's from them, from it coming off the telescope to them getting it is under a minute. 
I'm that. sorry, can I just jump in on that question? Was that that PyQT GUI slide you showed yeah. the spectrum? Yeah, so that's that's so the, the GUI and the interface is, is built on PyQT four and then um, but the, the, the back end for doing this is actually all in sure, in Python. That, that was the tool you were just telling me. Yeah, so that's a tool that we developed to, to do that. So. You mentioned you use IPython a lot for tutoring and stuff and collaboration. Is that um, are you using multiple IPython instances together or are you in any network mode? Uh, if you ship the notebook file itself to someone else when you finish work on it, how, how do you actually go about doing that? I probably use it more in that mode. Um, I have to admit, I have not fully explored the, the full networking mode capabilities of it. Um, it's been more of the once you've actually done something, like it's the package it up and, and send it over. And so that you're exchanging notebooks. Um, yeah. Do you guys have any kind of like almost manholes into any of your other systems where a notebook will integrate into another remote service and be like a mail client? I think that system. it's been kind of, if not a notebook, but something that was similar to that is something we've often talked about, you know, wanting to have. And, and things like SKA will actually certainly need things where they're not going to be able, you know, that you don't ship the data, but you, you ship the working on it. And we had previously investigated someone with looking at cloud um, usage as well. Um, and it's just uh, something that we haven't had enough time to, to fully investigate. So, but something always been a given more time we'd love to look at it. So. I'm sorry, I don't want to be a question pig, but can I go next? You mentioned uh, really tight tolerances, like you can you can detect this huge star moving at a meter, you know, whatever. Um, obviously that's a lot of floating point precision. You know, you got several layers of software in there from the raw uh, electrical engineering stuff to the $500,000 camera and its processor all the way up through uh, the scientific Python and the Python that you use to reduce the data. Um, is all that stuff dealt with, you know, is that what you pay the 500,000 bucks and super cool for, or do you actually do some of that phenomenal precision work along the way? Yeah, so for, for that phenomenal precision work, what they actually have to do is um, they actually send the light through a, uh, a glass tube containing iodine or containing iodine gas, and then actually take an image of it. And basically, the iodine gas uh, imprints on the spectra, basically very precisely where that spectra is actually located at. And then you actually have to do the analysis. So you get the data, but then that doesn't just give you what the result is. You do then have to do the analysis on it. It's actually very precise to predict you know, exactly where the lines are falling and to, you know, the, uh, and this is some stuff that we actually still need to work on. For example, is like how will you consent choice the lines? So, you know, for some of these um, very high end needs, you're trying to consent choice the line uh, to about a thousandth of a pixel. And so, you know, that's actually where, you know, your, how good your software is um, becomes very, very important. So it's not just you pay for this phenomenal piece of equipment. You pay for the phenomenal piece of equipment, and then you have to uh, keep working at using it better and better yeah. with your C and Python skills. I mean, using the packages. I mean, arguably, you'll end up paying. Um, you won't end up. Unfortunately, yeah, instruments aren't always budgeted with software in mind and how much they actually really need to be successful. Um, but the um, budget for actually what is actually required is actually quite high. And so it's you can't have a team of astronomers who are actually, you know, if you have 10 astronomers, you can think about how much each of those costs um, to actually produce very high quality scientific results. It's, it's, expensive. Expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of money working very hard. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's one, one last question. You're a really popular guy. It's, really <laughs> uh, it's actually related, but uh, I've got three questions. Seven minutes. Your picture of the spectrograph earlier on where you had calcium uh, and yeah. ferrous metal. Um, with, with that, um, 
So the question really is, how good is your accuracy? Um, you've got your qualitative side and quantitative side. So yeah. you've got your, you, can, you okay. can tell what's in it. Yeah. But can you tell how much and how accurate is it? Yeah, so um, the black, sorry, I didn't actually fully explain this. The black line here is the observations. The red is the model. That's our theoretical prediction okay. for what the spectrum should yeah, actually look like. Yeah. yeah, so you can see it's not obviously perfect, um, yeah. but it, it, uh, probably our models, our stellar atmosphere models are probably getting um, very, very uh, accurate. Uh, what's, yeah. what's the emission line? Uh, I think that, that actually might be H alpha. Okay. So In the star. In the, yeah, around the star. It's a young star, so it, it actually might be. Um, I think that that might be right around H alpha. So, uh, yeah, I know, I know. We'll get too deep. The it depends a lot on you know obviously how much you know the, the precision of the spectrograph. Um, this is coming from RSS, uh, which has a, basically a resolution of uh, what the astronomers said it's a resolution of about ten thousand, yeah. which corresponds to about um, roughly about a half the angstrom. So how accurately you can basically, uh, or your resolution element, how, how accurately you can resolve one of those lines is about half an angstrom. Okay. And so, uh, which is uh, 0.05 nanometers. And so, uh, cool. you know, yeah, so very, 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 very small. The other spectrograph can go, uh, that has modes up to about 70,000, a resolution of 70,000. So you can divide uh, that half an angstrom by another factor of seven. And so, you know, um, but it depends on how much signal noise you have, yeah. what your techniques for analysis are, what, how good your models are, you know, and so there is a lot of stuff that comes into it. Right. Um, I would say a good thumbs up of like how well we can know how much metals are in a given star would be, I mean, for a star, I'd probably say to a few percent. Um, for a, something like a galaxy, I'd say 10 percent, um, okay. you know, because you have a lot of other, a right. lot of stars in it, and yeah. so they blend together. So you're limited by the, the systematic, or you're limited by the intrinsic yeah. nature of the object sometimes. So. The other thought I had was whether you guys were using neural networks for pattern recognition at all? Not right now for this stuff. I've used some of this, I've used neural networks before for um, uh, some other code that I've done yeah. um, back in the previous life when I coded in C. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. I still have flashbacks. Yeah. <laughs> I still have flashbacks. Um, but yeah, so um, there is uh, um, one of the people, one of the astronomers who's very much involved with machine learning and Python, uh, or one of the persons very much with machine learning and Python, like the scikit learn packet, is an astronomer. Um, and they do do a lot of stuff like that. Uh, so there's some research going on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they love our data sets because they're. Exactly. A lot of them are there's a few. Data, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of data, and they're free on it. Yeah. Okay. okay, third question. I found ET yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. You just Not yet. Yet. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> we'll find the planet, so they'll follow up for the, the Britney Spears radio. <laughs> That's it, yeah. <laughs> we'll find out what they're listening to. Yeah, exactly. Funny, I have a question. How do you queue the work? Do you have like a web interface where guys log in and it and then they have like a tar break algorithm or? Yeah, so that's actually one bit of um, code that I didn't actually talk about is our Q scheduled algorithm, which is um, actually it's, it's uh, still not, or still in development, uh, but that does actually, um, you goes through and you can basically, uh, at the beginning of the semester, people fill in what they want to observe. And sometimes you get things that do come in on a given day, um, which are target of opportunity observations. But um, basically what happens though is that there is a queue that is then set up for what should get observed. Conditions change, um, uh, weather changes, so that queue can get mixed up. But basically, each each possible observation gets a score, and then the algorithm would go through and actually figure out uh, using like simulated annealing techniques or a greedy search to actually look for what would be actually the best observation. Does the observer then choose and then top they, of the list, or do they sometimes, is there, is there human intervention? Yeah, yeah. So right now, we still have a human intervention where uh, the observer, the salt astronomer who is on duty and doing the observations, then does, says, OK, yes, that does look like the best one for us. I'll, I'll reuse Bitcoin as my tie breaking algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> and also, it uh, would be cool, like, uh, see, do you guys do like a lot of asteroid hunting, mining for that? 
because obviously that's very interesting, especially for near Earth objects. Yeah, we have um, for for salt. Yeah, well, I unplug so you can. Um, for salt, uh, we have a, a narrow field of view, so we don't necessarily uh, you know we image a very small area on the sky, so we don't necessarily have a good uh, possibility of finding asteroids. So there's other surveys, some done from Sutherland, uh, which have a very wide field of view, and they're great for picking them up. And well, what they'll do is they'll find them, and we'll follow them up. So. Cool. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.